Thank you. May be seated in the Lord's presence. If you have your Bible with you, I'm going to ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And you know, popular in many memes within our culture today is a literary trope that is called suspension of disbelief. Suspended disbelief was a term that was actually coined in 1817 by the poet philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And, and suspended disbelief uh, applies in areas of fictional works and action and comedy and, and fantasy and horror movies and things like that. And I note that phrase today because this is my thesis. Here's our thesis for today's study. In order for believers to live in this world and not become abrasive pessimists and callous critics or cold skeptics, we have to sometimes willingly suspend our disbelief. In order to believe, sometimes you have to suspend disbelief. Coleridge suggested that if, if a writer could infuse human interest and a semblance of truth into an fa otherwise fantastic tale, the reader would suspend judgment concerning the implausibility of that narrative. He said suspension of disbelief for the moment is what constitutes poetic faith. And I'm going to go so far as to suggest from our scripture today that until you suspend your disbelief, you can never believe. Why? Because let me hit you with this definition. Faith is a choice to believe. Faith is not a feeling. We choose to believe. And if we do not choose, we will never believe. And faith begins with a conscious choice to suspend disbelief. But since you're not yet feeling me like I need you to, can I give you an experiential exegesis of suspended disbelief? Can I explain from your experience what it means to entertain the potential for the impossible, to imagine totally new outcomes, to discard the tired script of always been and write the new chapter of should be and open the door to what might be even if it never has been before? See, first off, on the one hand, notice, if you will, that suspension of disbelief is an essential element for an act. Now, for example, an audience is not expected to really believe that David, David Copperfield or Chris Angel actually cuts a woman in half or actually makes the Statue of Liberty disappear, but they still enjoy the performance. So then on the other hand, this is number two, suspension of disbelief is an essential component to live theater. It was recognized by Shakespeare, who refers to it in the prologue to Henry V, telling the audience, "'Tis your thoughts that must now deck our kings, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass." In other words, time is compressed and the passing of many years is overlooked as they go from scene to scene and set change to set change. And then third, suspension of disbelief is essential for the enjoyment of many of our movies and TV shows and stories. Because with any film, you have to ignore the reality. You are viewing a two-dimensional image on a screen and temporarily accept it as reality in order to be entertained. It also involves, many of them involve complex stunts and special effects and seemingly unrealistic plots and characters. And for example, suspension of disbelief is needed whenever a character is not supposed to age over the course of a 7, 8, 10, 11 year series and the characters of Glee are teenagers forever. One contemporary example is the audience's acceptance that Superman is able to hide his identity from the world by simply donning a pair of glasses, putting on conservative clothes, and acting in a mild-mannered fashion. And while some people take, take issue with the flimsiness of Superman's disguise, they do not take issue with the idea of the existence of a super being whose only weakness is kryptonite. But the thing I'm mostly talking about today, and this is number four, suspension of disbelief was essential for the Apollo 13 explosion not to have been fatal. This is the type of suspension of disbelief that we need in order to believe. Because en route to the moon, 200,000 miles above the earth, just under 56 hours after launch, that those three astronauts heard a loud bang as the number two oxygen tank exploded. And the crew was forced to shut down the command module and take refuge in the lunar landing module as their lifeboat. And considerable ingenuity under extreme pressure and suspension of disbelief was required for the, from the crew, the flight controllers, and the support personnel.
personnel in order to get that crew back safely. That drama developed on, on nationwide TV. The landing module, they had canisters for removing carbon dioxide, but they were not sufficient to support the crew until their return. The command module ha did have an adequate supply of canisters, but those were incompatible. So engineers on the ground were put into a room. They were given a box that mirrored the available materials on board the, the modules up there, and they were told to improvise a way to make those canisters work. And you know what they say, naysayers gonna, gonna nay. Naysayers gonna nay. But to accomplish their mission, they had to suspend disbelief until they could rig a way to make a square canister fit in a round socket by using a spacesuit return hose and duct tape. And I don't see why you're not getting this, because it was like the Game of Thrones meets Star Wars meets Mad Men, minus all of that, plus the news. And that is how faith works. In order to believe, you've got to start by suspending disbelief. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I, I know just what you're saying. You're saying, Alan, I don't know who told you I was going to be here today, but I don't think it's fair that they let you know that I have more faith in my comic book heroes than I do in God. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to admit that I suspend my disbelief to tune into my favorite serialized fiction television show. And yet I will not suspend disbelief in what God can do in me and what God can do through me. So you're right, I often have a self-defeating urge to give up before I've tried, to let go before I've grasped, to shut down before I've started. And I have a hard time disciplining myself to discard the notion that certain things cannot happen and opening up myself to the notion that they can happen. Things like life after death purpose for living, forgiveness of sins, getting rid of guilt, walking in purity, getting over an addiction. I mean, in all of these things, I'm having a hard time factoring God into the equation because I'm not willing to suspend my disbelief. And if I'm not a hot mess, I'm at least a room temperature mess. <laughs> so don't let me live here till you show me. How is it that faith really works? I'd be glad to help you out because when God is in you, when he is working for you, it alters the atmosphere, it changes the circumstance, it opens you to an ever-expanding universe of possibilities by God's providence. So don't tell me what can't happen when God is in the mix. Don't tell me what's not possible when God is in the mix. Don't tell me what won't work when God is in the mix. We can overcome the disadvantages of our past. We can rise above the challenges of our present. We can go beyond anybody's prediction about our future when God is in the mix. We can get over what happened to us. We can get past what is trying to stop us. We can go through the storm swirling around us when God is in the mix. So let me take you to our text, Luke chapter 10, where we learn that anything is possible when God is in the mix. And it is our faith that gets us there. Because faith is deaf to doubt, it is dumb to discouragement, it is blind to defeat, and it knows nothing but trust in God. Why? Because that is the testimony of our text. As we look at Luke 10, we're given a textual telescope, a scriptural snapshot, a biblical biopsy of how faith works. And it shows up with four characters, the centurion, his servant, the sages, and the savior. Let me give you the backstory so you can appreciate the story. The life of Christ encompasses three phases. He had a year of obscurity, a year of popularity, and then a year of opposition. The year of obscurity is mostly described in John chapter three and four. But this event right here occurs right after the Sermon on the Mount. So by Luke chapter 7, Jesus it is a transitional time in his ministry between years 1 and 2, between obscurity and popularity. The momentum is swelling, his reputation is spreading, and having just completed a crusade in Judea, he turns his attention to Capernaum. And here he encounters a faith so vital and vibrant and viable that it shocked, it surprised, it amazed even the Son of God. Step into this story in the scriptures with me as its central character is the centurion. And first, this is letter A, he was an established man. Let the whole church say established. 
He lived in Capernaum, the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He was part, uh, living in part of the common uh, wealth of Israel as to their land, but he was not part as to their nation. He was outside the community of promise, and yet he was full of faith in Israel's God. By vocation, he was a soldier. His acumen, his diligence, intelligence, and competence had won for him a role of company commander. Centurion was a powerful position with three to five platoons of men underneath him. He was the backbone of the Roman army because he was established as a professional soldier. And then second, letter B, he was an exceptional man. Let the whole church say exceptional. Because the Romans did not pick Lottie Dottie and just any old body to be a centurion. I mean, just like MIB, men in black, they had to be the best of the best of the best. And Polybius tells us how in order to be selected, you had to be a natural leader. You had to be a reliable, dependable, steady, sedate in spirit. You had to be willing to hold your ground when beaten and ready to die at your post. This centurion was established and exceptional, but third, this is letter C, he was an unegotistical man. And don't miss that because he assumes center stage in the scripture in order to articulate his compassionate concern for his servant who had become ill. And that alone is amazing because such slaves in the Roman Empire were reg regarded by law as simply living tools to be used, abused, and discarded when broken. Slaves in the Roman Empire had no status, no rights, they could be mistreated, even killed with impunity. And so the centurion of position, power, and social status did not follow the Roman mentality because his compassionate concern was for somebody else. Now, can I just stick a pin in this paragraph? Because it is on that issue we get the first clue as to how faith works. Anybody want to hear this? Just say, don't punk me, Alan. I'll even take silence as consent because it's just that important. The centurion's example informs us that first off, this is number one, faith works to help the helpless. Let the whole church say helpless. And I know your grandma said that the good book says God helps those who help themselves. But right after that, her Ouija board said, learn more Bible. You better learn more Bible because the Bible does not say that. Scriptures really proclaim we are all beyond helping ourselves. Our only hope is in God helping us. So this man's faith worked on behalf of somebody who was helpless. He was commanding, but he was not callous. We know a lot about him and less about his servant. All we know is his servant was sick to the point of death. And in Matthew's parallel account, in Matthew 8, verse 6, it portrays the centurion as if he came himself instead of through the elders of the synagogue, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. He's paralyzed and in great pain. Yet we never see him. Jesus never meets him. Nobody ever mentions his name. That is the centurion. So let's look at the servant. Because he was sick, and because of his sickness, this is letter A, he was vulnerable. Let the whole church say vulnerable. I mean, he was helpless, but thank God he was not hopeless. Despite the ministration of ancient medication, he was, had not recuperated. Every day he grew weaker and worser. Can you see him on the screen of your anointed imagination? Lying nameless and motionless with labored breathing, sweaty brow, racing pulse, an occasional groan of unrelenting agony. And with every moment, the encroaching hand of death grew, drew closer. He was vulnerable, and yet second, this is letter B, he was valued. Let the whole church say valued. The servant was valued by the soldier. So his imminent trip to the cemetery was interrupted by the courageous intervention of that established and exceptional centurion. The centurion suspended his disbelief so he could act to intercede not only on his own behalf, but on behalf of his servant. The servant was valued because as a man with social status and positional power, the centurion had compassion on him. He was concerned about him. And that is how faith works. It works to help those who cannot help themselves. That means it deems the vulnerable as valuable. 
That's, because, that's why I gave you the report this morning about how many, how many ladies they had at the Bible study in Chillicothe. How many kids got saved in our detention home ministry. What a tutorial this is for all of us who live in a market-driven, results-oriented economy. Because in our, our day, those who are small, weak, sick, infirm, disabled, addicted, or uneducated are quickly diminished, discarded, and disdained. This is where Christ-likeness steps in to help us because you don't have to cure the addicted. Addiction is one of the toughest nuts to crack. All you have to do is get the addicted to suspend their disbelief and choose to have faith that even they can glorify God with their life. I saw a picture this last week of a drug addict reading their Bible by the light of a cigarette lighter they had. Because if the devil won't let you go, then glorify God while he's squeezing you. <laughs> Billy Sunday used to say, listen, I'm against the devil. I'll kick him as long as I got a foot. I'll fight him as long as I got a fist. I'll butt him as long as I got a head. I'll bite him as long as I got a tooth. And whenever, whenever I'm old, fistless, footless, and toothless, I'll gum him till we go home to glory. <laughs> and he goes home to perdition. Sometimes that's the only way faith works, but faith does work like that. I know you don't think I'm in Bible country, but wait. Rahab believed God and glorified God as a prostitute. And the good thing is God's glory and the devil's dysfunction cannot dwell together. So if you can get anybody to suspend disbelief, exercise faith, then that faith is eventually going to work to produce godliness. That is what we see right here in the centurion. He is stuck as part of the occupying, oppressing Roman army, just like an addict is stuck to crack. And yet this unusual man's example of faith existed in the army of the occupier, among the empire of the oppressor. This servant was vulnerable, yet he was valued. That is why the centurion sought to help him when he was helpless. Why the soldier sent the sages of Jesus' home synagogue in order to go and supplicate with the Savior. And this is how faith works. Because second, on the other hand, this is number two. Faith works toward the possible despite any problems. Because any loving spiritual thing that is possible is going to face opposition. Now, I should have had a huge amen right there. I mean, it should have been huge amen because problems do not mean that it's not possible or not worthwhile. Watch, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 11, through faith, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Faith functions toward that which is possible despite problems that stand in the path. Sarah suspended disbelief and she chose instead to trust and her faith activated the faithfulness of God to give her strength. Okay, watch. Luke chapter 7, read with me in verse 1. Now, when Jesus had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent him unto the elders of the Jews, bese beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. The centurion had not seen Jesus, had never met Jesus, but he moved solely on the basis of what he heard about Jesus. Okay, you missed that, so let me be kind and rewind. Somebody talked to him and told him about the Lord. Who have you talked to so that they know about the Lord? I mean, that's what it started with. Somebody talked to him about the Lord. We don't know just what he knew, but maybe somebody told him how Jesus went to a wedding. And when the champagne fountain ran dry, he turned water into wine. Maybe somebody told him how Jesus slipped on his water walking Nikes and strolled on the sea like a sidewalk. How with three words he silenced thunder. He made lightning pull back its limber tongue. He made the sea stop churning. I mean, Jesus took a filet of fish combo from a primordial McDonald's, fed 5,000 people, and sent his disciples home with 12 baskets of McNuggets. <laughs> Taco Bell said, Taco Bell said their new Dorito Lo a Locos Taco helped them create jobs. Yeah, the mobility scooter factory just went into three chefs. But since the centurion himself was a Gentile, 
He requisitioned a delegation of Jewish elders. He sent those sages to the Savior to offer his request on behalf of his servant. Are you talking to anybody about Jesus? Are you giving a testimony about what God has done for you? Somebody near you but outside these walls needs to know about the Lord. But be careful because many of us who profess faith don't really practice it. We get concerned about upholding our image and our reputation and avoiding embarrassment instead of working in faith. I mean, think about the risk that this established exceptional man took. What if his superiors heard about his unapproved faith? What if he was demoted, his career was destroyed? What if Jesus wouldn't listen to him? What if Jesus rejected him because he wasn't Jewish? If you do not suspend disbelief, your what ifs will hold you back from your just maybes. If you limit God to what only you can think he can do for you, you will never see anything miraculous in your life. So this exceptional soldier suspended his disbelief. He renounced his Roman skepticism because he was not willing to limit Jesus to his doubts. That way his faith could work toward the possible despite all the problems. And then third, third, faith works by paying it forward. This required some huge steps because this man didn't have the benefit of LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter in order to connect with Jesus online. He had to do it old school. He had to find somebody who knew Jesus to go to Jesus and intercede. And the amazing thing is, they went. He suspended disbelief about that because relations between Romans and Jews were tortured and tense. But here is a delegation of Jewish sages going as intercessors to make supplication on behalf of the soldier before the Savior. Now, can I help somebody out up in here? Because this is how faith works. Do not wait until you need something before you do something. You need to pay it forward by faith. Watch verse 4. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom they should do this. For he loveth our nation. He hath built us a synagogue. He was, th this centurion was able to move confidently in the present because in the past, he had established a relationship with God. In the past, he, has, he had an established track record with the church. He had a history of contributing compassionately without being celebrated. And notice in the text that he never talks about what he did, but the Jews did. And if anybody deserves a miracle, they say, this brother does. He loves our nation, though he is part of the alien force oppressing our nation and occupying our land. Most of his people are antagonistic to us, but not him. And to illustrate his identification with us, he built a synagogue you worship in whenever you come here. So yes, he is a Roman, but that he does not possess their bias nor, nor promote their prejudice. He worships with us as one of the righteous Gentiles. This military commander was kind-hearted, public spirit, and generous in supporting ministry. He didn't have to be goaded into giving. Now let me open a window on that word because I hope this is not true of you, but the phone rang in the pastor's office one time and, and it was special agent from the IRS and that agent said, I'm calling to inquire about one of your members, Dr. Stiff. Last year, Dr. Stiff claimed on his income tax return a $35,000 deduction for a contribution he said he made to your church. Can you verify that? There was a long pause and the pastor calculated. He concluded that the man who was a surgeon did indeed probably make $350,000 that year, but not remembering any record of giving, pastor said, I'll tell you what, let me talk to him and then call me back tomorrow and I'm sure I will be able to confirm that to you. <laughs> well, this centurion didn't have to be goaded into giving. See, because faith works to pay it forward and do something before you need something. So he sent some sages based on the possibility Jesus shared his concern for those who were vulnerable and yet value. He worked toward the possible despite the problems because faith is positive expectation. And, and, and that's how faith work, but works. But here's the fourth thing. The fourth thing before us is this, because faith works in a context of humility and honor. You need to be humble before God and, and give the honor to God. See, the elders pleaded with Jesus to come heal the servant. And so Jesus was coming, verse 6. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was not, now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. 
saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Jesus was willing to come, but he never made it to the centurion's house. Instead, the centurion sent, sent a second group of intercessors, and this time they were friends, not elders, and they explained two things, his humility and his honor. Verse 7, Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. And you've got to get this before you go. In verse 4, the elders said, he's worthy. In verse 6, what he says about himself is, I am not in verse 7, he says, but, say in a word, you just speak the word, Jesus, and your word will do the work. Amen. Now, that's amazing me, because using his own military paradigm as a frame of reference, the centurion opens an illustration in verse 8, for I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say to one, go, and he goeth, to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. That is my honor. When I give a command, my words are obeyed. I don't have to be personally present for my orders to be carried out. Now, I have heard what they are saying about you, and if my limited human authority can produce instant obedience among my men, how much more will your unlimited authority as a son of God produce right here? I have suspended my logical, analytical, critical disbelief. You are who you say you are. You can, you can do what they say you do. So you don't have to come under my unworthy roof to heal my, heal my servant because you don't have to be present to show your power. I know there's power in your word. Now, how do I know that? Because I was at synagogue last Sabbath, and while I was standing there in the synagogue at the back with all the other onlooking Gentiles, here's what I heard being said. Psalm 107. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distress. How? He sent His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. You say, Alan, you can't say he heard that. You can't say he didn't. You weren't there. Suspend your disbelief, my brother. Suspend your disbelief, my sister, because that's what they did in the synagogue as they read the word. Jesus saying a word. I wonder if there's anybody on your road today who wants the word of God to speak to them. Anybody who has such faith that works, that, that they say, I don't have to show up at your house, it's good enough. God has spoken the word over your house. Faith functions in a context of humility before God and, and honor to God. But as long as you think you deserve a blessing, you don't deserve it anymore. Because blessing is not based on what you deserve. It's always based on grace. So fifth, in the final analysis, faith functions in an uncommon way to get an unusual result. Verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. That word marveled means to wonder or admire. Jesus was stunned at this man's faith because it was greater than that of his own countrymen in Israel. And watch what Jesus says to the crowd, verse 9, and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. His faith was unexpected, unashamed, unassuming, and unusual. And, it, and if you bring the Lord an unusual, Unusual faith, it will always yield an unusual result. Why? Because when Jesus heard what the centurion said, he did him one up. Oh, you know one up. Oh, you don't know one up. Watch, verse 10. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Centurion said, just say, just say in your word, Jesus. Just, just speak the word. Just say a word. But Jesus never spoke a word except to the crowd behind him. Jesus did him one up, meaning I will go further than you ask me to go. I will do more than, than you could even ask or think. So, so he never said be healed. He just healed. He didn't send a prayer cloth ahead. He didn't anoint him with oil in, the, in advance. He didn't wave a blanket over his head or wave his suit coat at him like Benny Hinn likes to do. He didn't speak in an unknown tongue or fall out in front of the crowd. Jesus just did him one up. And I don't know how you feel about it, but in the end, that's what I'd rather have. He doesn't have to answer me if he'll just do for me. He doesn't have to answer me if his word will just speak to me. And check this about how faith works. The servant got healed as a residual result of the centurion's faith. 
And the centurion's faith got rewarded as a residual result of the elders' intercession. And both of them got answers because they were associated with the right people. Hanging with the wrong crowd will block your blessing. Oh, you need to be clear on how faith works. But I got good news for somebody, somebody on your row today. They're going to be blessed today just because they're sitting near you. Just because you prayed for them. Just because some, I don't know if anybody ever gets saved that somebody else doesn't pray for. I have a personal belief that nobody ever comes to Christ except somebody in their life was praying that they get saved. We have people praying for you. You need to be giving God the praise. You need to humbly honor the Lord. Go ahead and grab the hand of your neighbor and stand.